Okay, thank you, Meta. Well, I'll just add a few more words about my uh, biography. I got a PhD in uh, nuclear physics at Yale University in the States, in Connecticut. I'm orig originally from Montreal. And, um, and then I worked for AT&T Bell Labs in New Jersey for a very long time. But I was sent on a mission for three years between 1974 and 77 to Sandia National Laboratories where they make nuclear weapons. But I basically for a long time was a laser person and we were in our laboratory consisting of about 50 staff members. Our job was to devise a laser that could shoot down a Russian missile 10,000 kilometers away. That's pretty far. We thought we could do it. I think it's still possible, but there are other ways to shoot down missiles. And uh, around 1982 or so, Eric Fawcett, who had worked at Bell Labs, uh, came for a visit. He talked to me. He recruited me to Science for Peace. So I joined the anti-nuclear movement in the States. And uh, so I was active for a while. But then I lost my job at AT&T, and I became a professor at Laval University. And I was quiet for a while. But in the last five years, I've been recruited by Pierre Jasmin of Science for Peace and Pugwash. And uh, so I've been more active. And uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about my thinking the, over the next uh, five or six minutes. So the main point I want to make is the following, that uh, drone technology could be developed to save lives. That's the official military US line, to save lives but on both sides of a conflict. Now, have you noticed that this goal is part of international law on war? You have to minimize your own losses, but even the losses on the other side. As an example, you don't kill prisoners and you don't kill civilians. In other words, drones could best be used for reconnaissance, as they are now, and for making prisoners not to kill them. I think we should try to honor the third article of the Universal Human Rights Declaration of the United Nations in December 1948, which listed different criteria, but one of them was to protect the lives of everybody. And uh, I think drone technology, if developed further as it is now, will achieve that on both sides. We can make prisoners and we will save our soldiers. I have benefited from reading the Stimson Report. There's a very important center in Washington called the Stim Stimson Center. Uh, they did a one-year study of dr US drone policy, and they put out a report, which is online, in June of 2014. If you want to find it, just put Stimson Center, US policy drone, and you'll find it right away. It's about 55 pages. It's a very good report. And in terms of giving the data on drones and drone warfare, it's pretty much in agreement with recent books that have come out. The book that I have uh, especially paid attention to is a book by two Canadians, Anne Rogers and John Hill. And uh, it's very good when you have Canadians talk about US policy, because when you are in the US, and I was for 25 years, the, uh, the weight of uh, the elite is very heavy, very heavy. I was fired from AT&T partly because, partly, because I was a little bit too involved in my anti-nuclear work. AT&T had a division of military affairs, so they didn't like to have people speak against some weapons. Also, I benefited immensely from a book that Tom Davis, who's sitting in the back, pointed out to me. It's a recent book, 2015, by William Arkin, whom uh, many of people here know. It's called Unmanned Drones, Data, and the Illusion of Perfect Warfare. Data is a very big thing, and I have told a few people here that their data isn't here. The data that Americans have now on people everywhere in the world runs in the petabytes. And there are so much data on different people in the world that Washington, all these people in Washington and the States are drowning in data, drowning. 
In the Stimson report, they said how uh, 4,000 people have been killed so far, principally in three countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Yemen. And uh, they've been killed by drones under what Americans call targeted killings. And the statistics are that probably 2,000 of them were innocent civilians, bystanders, and 2,000 were people suspected of terrorism. The U.S. does that uh, by arguing that the people they're killing were preparing an attack on the United States. So they say they killed these people out of self-defense. The Stimson report, 90% of the Stimson report is very critical of U.S. policy. There's only a 10% that says, well, here is how you could improve it. So the improvement I described to Walter a while ago when he was asking me at, at supper time, the, the trend is for more precision. At the moment, they have one foot precision. And uh, they're going to get down to even, Walter was saying it, probably millimeter precision. So if they want to get Walter, they're going to send a drone about bird size through one of the doors or windows. And the drone will come and will target Walter. What I recommend is that we treat human beings as well as we treat bears. Why don't they shoot a dart just to put him to sleep? And then a few FBI agents will come to the door and take him and he'll ask, they'll ask him questions. But why don't we just put people to sleep? I'll have you notice that, you know, when Kalashnikovs were developed for a war, but they're used everywhere now, everywhere. And in the States, almost anybody can buy a Kalashnikov someplace. So uh, the drone technology will be used by police forces. The, the philosophy of the uh, police, police forces in the States now sometimes is shoot first, ask questions <coughs> later. I'm not sure that you uh, support this kind of policy. The, uh, the best book on drones, I think, is the one that Tom Davis pointed out to me by William Arkin, who is very well known. He's a guy who's worked in human rights. Uh, he's an extremely uh, talented person. He's been in Iraq. He's been everywhere. And uh, he is extremely critical of U.S. drone policy. But I have dual, citizen, dual citizenship, as several of you have here. and. Uh, I assert that not everything done by the U.S. military is bad, or even the FBI or the CIA. There can be some good things coming out of the U.S. There are examples here in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if they succeed technologically having that precision, I'm sure that Walter will escape with just a dart and put to sleep for 48 hours. I rem let me remind you that many important persons have been killed. You know, John Kennedy, Bob Kennedy, Martin Luther King, all kinds of really good, important people have been killed. So why don't we just teach all these malevolent people to just put other people to sleep if they have bad ideas about them? So I highly really like recommend these books, but I will conclude because the time is short and we can talk a little more later. Uh, the, a book I highly recommend, which is quite general, written, written by an anthropologist, Elizabeth Zellman. Uh, it came out in 2014. It's called uh, Our Beleaguered Species. You know very well that we're threatened by lots of things. And her way out is beyond tribalism. Uh, people who work at the University of Toronto belong to a tribe. And here's a witness. We're at Laval University or in the military Canadian forces. Everybody belongs to a tribe, and usually these tribes, they think they have a better understanding of what's going on, and they're almost always right. Right? Uh, if you say so. <laughs> so anyway, it's an excellent book. Uh, you would enjoy having that book because you'll learn a lot about yourself. Hmm. She describes the human being starting about a few million years ago and uh, she relies on lots of other books. You will understand yourself a lot better and other people around you from reading that book. And her recipe beyond tribalism is an excellent one. 
It's in the Stimson report. The Stimson report out of Washington says, we should extend the rule of law, which prevails in Toronto, usually most of the time. Why don't we extend the rule of law to the whole planet? So I'll end here and pass the microphone to Walter. Mm -hmm. well, I think it's pretty easy to um, continue from that point because you come to Thank very you. much the same conclusion. Um, I do uh, work in the military tribe during the day. And <laughs> some people feel that uh, when I come to meetings like Science or Peace, that uh, I am come like the uh, wolf in sheep's clothing, <laughs> and that I am uh, really disguised, and I'm going to present a military point of view. Um, well, I, I can actually tell you when I'm at work at the Canadian Forces College, I'm actually a, a sheep in wolf's clothing, <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to push the military to think about to the, the dangers of, of uh, various uh, approaches, uh, mili overly militaristic approaches, and the dangers of, of weapons. Um, on this issue of uh, lethal drones, I happen to be a very conflicted sheep, actually, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, how I try and deal with this issue, <coughs> and certainly in the discussion we will all be trying to deal with that and we can figure out where, whether we can collectively help each other. So it was the missile attack that changed the nature of warfare in October 2001. Um, a less than a month after the September 11th attacks. An unarmed CIA drone was overflying Afghanistan and was watching a car which with alleged Taliban um, fighters inside of it. It uh, shot a Hellfire missile and uh, destroyed the, the car entirely. Um, the leader uh, that was the intended target actually escaped and other branches of the um, military and the um, intelligence um, m intelligence community in the United States saw that, that an a, a opportunity had been missed to actually follow someone and, and, and actually be able to deal something with them because there being a premature use of, uh, of the Hellfire missile and this new, new technology which um, was actually controlled by someone halfway around the world. Um, somebody working out of Nevada, the pilot and the payload operator were um, look, located in um, CIA, CIA uh, facilities. And what happened uh, there is uh, shocking in the sense that um, there was a new innovation in technology that allowed um, a new form of an old, very primitive capacity which is assassination. So the, um, the, because there was a new way of doing it, people thought this is something new, but you have to still call the activity of targeted killing when you're not in active warfare as assassination. And the experience of the US had been um, so very selective uh, assassination attempts, 1950s and 60s, and then uh, the Watergate, era, the decision to stop assassinations. And then after September 11th, this was loosened. Um, and then this new technology was brought in. And now there have been thousands of, uh, of killings from uh, armed drones by the United States. And uh, my, my concern is that people think because the way that it's being done is different, that the actual, what you're actually doing is, is in some ways new, but it's not. And how do you deal with this problem of um, assassination? And I go back to Michelle's point that in the end we'll need some form of rule of law to deal with this situation because if you just allow the United States government or you allow any, any government leader in the world, once they are equipped with this new technology, to be able to justify the targeted uh, killings or the assassinations, then it can come back to haunt you. And it, especially in the United States, where there is, a, uh, in a democracy, a great vulnerability of leaders and, and people. So, um, w exploring the ways that we can bring this to a halt or, or bring it to c under control, I, the, ho the hawk or the wolf side of me says that there is a need for in selective individuals to be um, stopped from doing what they're going to do. Now, it could be that the tranquilizer a dart, dart, which is really the ultimate solution, is instead of killing these people, bring them to justice. So you need a sort of special operations forces to go in. And that's 
the answer to most of the, the problems in terms of bringing about peace in the world is actually uh, being able to capture people, bring them before a process by which they're innocent and proven guilty, and bringing the rule of law to the world, just as we've brought it, as you say, in, into Toronto today. Um, the challenge is that uh, we don't yet have a court system whereby we can do that, except for the International Criminal Court, of course, which the United States is not a, a member of the court, and will it will make sure that it's not bound by the court. In fact, um, next year there will be a decision by the International Criminal Court whether the crime of aggression is made uh, a crime that's under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. And um, it's already been, it's in the Rome Statute, but it needs a vote next year. And the U.S. is making sure that there's no way that they, that they can be um, brought to justice under that provision. So um, the, the, the path is going to be long, but there, are, there should be a mechanism by which targeted killings can be justified through a legal system relying on the Geneva Conventions um, under extreme need, but not under the political whims of the U.S. government. I'm going to move on to the, uh, the next subject of lethal autonomous weapons because it's also an area where a new technology is being introduced and has the potential to do tremendous damage and the solution is actually quite similar. So the, uh, a new generation of drone um, won't actually need a pilot far away. It could actually be programmed to terminate um, a target by itself without any human being in the loop. And this is now um, a technological capability. It's um, not yet a, a reality from the point of view of, of being produced, but it is uh, well enough along in the research and development stage to have lethal autonomous weapons. That is lethal being able to kill someone, uh, autonomous being able to make the decision about whether to terminate a life or um, and then then robot so lethal autonomous robot as preferred term as opposed to the more widespread use of term in the diplomatic community of laws lethal autonomous weapon system and the uh, the LARS um, have some major problems and and um, there's I have called five a reasons why LARS should be uh, banned. First of all, there's the danger, uh, extreme danger of accident. That um, if, a, if a lethal autonomous robot is, is out there, then it, it, it can easily make, a, make a, a mistake and it just keeps firing until it runs out of battery or until some sort of instruction is properly put in, into it. But the more autonomous it is, the more difficult it is to do that. And there, there is a community of scientists and thinkers who think that uh, autonomous systems are actually extremely valuable um, because you can remove the danger to the, your, the soldier's life from your own country uh, because the reaction can be quicker if you have a, a robot and is uh, at a um, high noon shootout then the robot will win over the human being. They're just um, much, much more capable. And uh, some people even argue that they can be d do things more rationally. They might not shoot out of anger. They might be more uh, actually intelligent than human beings. Um, so, and they can be better controlled. Uh, um, so that's the, the argument on one side. The danger is, of course, that, that they uh, get out of control. And this is the stuff of science fiction films, uh, whether you're talking about the, the Terminator films or, or, or or a whole range of uh, films where, where robots are just beyond the control and, and they, they commit uh, atrocities through accident or through uh, their own uh, faulty programming. Another uh, A problem with the um, autonomous systems is accountability. So if a robot uh, comes in and shoots someone, then, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's clearly unjustified, it's an error, then who's accountable? Are you going to hold the robot accountable and say, I am going to, uh, there's a robot speaking to us right now. Um, we have uh, the, the danger that the robot could commit an accident. And how do you hold that robot accountable? Do you pull its plug and say, aha, there you are, now we're going to have justice? 
are we, are we going to say that the person who programmed the robot is at fault? That, that there, or we're going to say the person who turned the machine on and put it into the environment where it is is, is at fault? There's a huge accountability problem um, with this uh, lethal autonomous systems. <coughs> Another uh, a problem is access. So if, um, if a, a robot is, um, is sent out by a power to, to, to take action in, in, a, in a battle space, and the other side takes control of that robot. So the, the robot has a fair amount of autonomy, but it also has communication links back to the, um, the its headquarters, or um, sometimes we call it uh, man on the loop as opposed to man in the loop. On the loop meaning having some veto power. In this uh, scenario of, uh, of someone hacking into a robot, it could be used against uh, civilian population. You could take very <coughs> sophisticated US weapon systems and actually not have to develop be in another country or a terrorist group, develop your own systems, but simply rely on the weapon systems that are there. The Iranians, for instance, um, said that they had taken control of a um, UAV flying over Iranian t territory and brought it down and they demonstrated it in front of the media. So they had hacked into the UAV and uh, it has self-characteristics, um, but they could control it. Well, if they can hack uh, that kind of surveillance UAV, uh, what's to stop them from hacking into an armed UAV? So very, very dangerous and especially one that, that's uh, like in the autonomous realm. I'm also concerned about availability. If lethal autonomous weapons are uh, become available, then uh, it will, they'll start to prol proliferate. Once the United States uh, or another country decides that yes, we are going to uh, go into the lethal autonomous field, then we're then they there will be um, a desire from other countries to also acquire that, and and not only countries but also the uh, various groups. So it's it's quite dangerous to have um, this pr proliferation. And finally, acceptability, and this goes to the core of the, um, the the humanitarian and human rights argument. Do we want to allow machines to make the decision about killing? human beings. Um, the, it, there's something viscerally wrong with this concept and um, that, um, that, uh, that concludes the, the five A's that I mentioned. I'll just, uh, just uh, say again. Accident, accountability, access, availability, and uh, acceptability. Um, now where do we stand on this? So last um, a, a week from Monday, a week before Monday, I was at Foreign Affairs and the, um, the arms control and disarmament uh, branch uh, representatives said that the uh, Canadian government feels that it's premature to come out on a decision on this, that it's a uh, technology that has not been used, and that um, there are lots of gray areas where you can develop systems that are uh, quite autonomous and may still have value, and there are dual use possibilities where you can do a good things with these autonomous systems. And um, I considered the government's position as being fence sitting. That, um, that there is a, a, a moral dimension here and that uh, my recommendation at the time and more generally is a moratorium on research and development on lethal autonomous robots to stop the research and the development of these systems and supplement that with a negotiated ban on LARS so that we have a, a system of international law that can help really decelerate the development where artificial intelligence is pushing ahead at a rapid, rapid rate that we have a legal basis on which to decelerate the proliferation and advancement of this new weapon system. And hopefully the, Cana the new Canadian government, the Trudeau, go Trudeau government, will revise the, the older policy of uh, fence sitting and be able to provide some leadership um, the United States government has a moratorium on uh, R&D of fully autonomous weapon system, um, but uh, that can be taken away at any time. It needs to be replaced with something much more permanent like a ban. And for those who argue that the LARS are not yet invented, um, then and so how can we possibly ban them? I would only point to the issue of the laser blinding weapons. 
which before they were actually in place in, in wind mill <coughs> arsenals were banned. There are ways to ban developments before they've committed the atrocities, before, um, think of chemical weapons having uh, killed um, hundreds of thousands of people um, and uh, blinded uh, and caused widespread casualties in World War I, then we had to ban them. Well, let's try and put uh, some prevention here. So we put in place a uh, moratorium immediately and then a ban as, as soon as it can be negotiated so that the world can be made safer and that we can actually um, have the rule of law as a solution. So only to reinforce what Michelle has said, that the, the rule of law based on effective international governance is the, the way that we can deal with both the uh, targeted drone assassinations with the advent of the new weapon system, lethal autonomous weapons, and <coughs> indeed help to bring the long cherished dream of peace into uh, greater reality here on our planet. Thank you. Thank you. Right. <laughs> okay, says so our, our meal. Uh, thank you very much, Meta. I'm tempted to just say amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> Because, and you will notice some overlap, especially in, in some of the, the latter uh, part of, of, of Walter's presentation. It's great to be here. I mean, thank you for coming. Thanks to Meta, a very special thanks to Meta for she keeps inviting me and, and I keep keep accepting. And so, so it's a great honor to be here. I want to talk. Uh, uh, we're very much interested in the drones debate, but I want to focus specifically on the on the lethal autonomous weapons systems debate, or LARS, or killer robots. And and and, and as uh, as I'll say in a minute, it's more more than a matter of semantics, and there are some implications in in, in the wording that, that is used to, to describe these these weapons. As as Meta said, I, w I recently had the opportunity to be in Geneva at the CCW, which is a convention on certain conventional weapons, which was which was uh, holding discussions of an informal experts group on autonomous weapons specifically, which is actually a welcome diplomatic development that there's there's some some diplomatic attention and energy and resources devoted to 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 this issue, and I think it's a, it's a testament to the. To the to the greater realization and awareness uh, within within and without governments that we are really seeing uh, the tip of the iceberg and uh, without wanting to overstate the, the situation we really are seeing the tip of the iceberg uh, in terms of, of drones in terms of killer ro uh, killer uh, robots but more generally in terms of uh, the uh, a package we call emerging military technologies and I think the the fundamental question we need to come to terms with is whether or not these technologies are outpacing the capacity of the international community to actually regulate them and to, and to come to terms with their implications and, and, and their, their risks. Uh, at the Geneva conference, and this is a days long conference, you know, it seemed like there wasn't enough time to go over the multifaceted dimensions of, of these weapon systems, so I won't try to cover everything in, in 10 or 15 minutes uh, that, that, <coughs> that I will speak here today. But what I hope to do is to give you a bit of a flavor of the different dynamics that are shaping the current debates about lethal weapon, uh, autonomous system, lethal autonomous weapon systems, where, where this might go, what, what, what are the prospects realistically for regulation, where Canada stands, and, and Walter already hinted uh, on, on, some of those, uh, on some of those points. So, so my particular focus will, I'll try to come back, I mean, throughout my presentation on the legal the uh, implications on the ethical implications, the humanitarian implications, and the diplomatic effort really to, uh, the, the, the collective <coughs> international diplomatic effort to, to tackle these, these uh, technological developments, specifically uh, say related to killer robots. So what are killer robots? What are we talking about? So, uh, so if we go by this acronym, it's, it says Lethal Autonomous Weapon Systems, which, which uh, you know, uh, uh, happens to spell loss, uh, and, and it's, it's the one thing where we don't have uh, to regulate them. But uh, other, other names have been proposed, and, 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 and uh, uh, other people insert an F there, a Fully Autonomous Weapon System. And while, although there are similarities with drones in terms of the emerging technologies package, in terms of questions of applicability of international humanitarian law, accountability, et cetera, the distinction here, what makes laws uh, the, the distinct, unique, and problematic is the fully autonomous nature. I mean, that there will be no, minimum, uh, no, uh, no meaningful human control. So these are systems that can select engage, target, and kill another human being without any human interaction 
whatsoever. So again, there's a, it, it, and while it may seem a bit like a science fiction territory and it might evoke images of Terminator like, like, like figures, I mean, this is very real and, it's, it's, uh, and most experts say it's a matter of, of, of years, of a few years before we're actually there. And I'll, I'll tell you why, why it's difficult to even, to even try to, to, to narrow all the developments down and, and keep them together because, I mean, they're very scattered and very diffuse. But that's the essence of it, systems that can engage and kill uh, human beings based on a certain predetermined software. Typically, imagine an algorithm. Uh, algorithm. So you send a system into into Aleppo or Fallujah or some hot spot, hot spot and uh, the, the algorithm says, if it looks like a male between 18 and 40 years of age, shoot to kill, that sort of thing. And it's, it's, it's very scary because, you know, there, there is, uh, in the best of scenarios, there, there's room for for mistakes, for, for, for imprecision, et cetera. And it may be a teenager who's a non-combatant, but still fits a certain profile. But again, there is no human present in the, in the, in the, in the act of targeting, engaging, and killing, which makes it problematic. And, and, and that's just uh, the some of the practical reasons in terms of compliance with international humanitarian law. But I'll say a few words also in a minute about the ethical and moral imperative, I mean, to, to stop this from, from becoming a reality. Let me just say that, uh, that <clears throat> the general agreement is that these systems do not yet exist. Uh, we're on the verge of them existing, and, 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 uh, and that should underscore the need for a proactive approach to, uh, to, to regulating lethal autonomous weapon systems. As, we, as we, uh, I'm sure many of you know or are aware, uh, uh, efforts to regulate a certain category of weapon after it has already been used in warfare are ever more complicated. You know, it's, it's, uh, chemical, uh, chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, biological weapons, since after they've been used, uh, it's harder and it's more complicated. But here we have really a unique opportunity as an international community to be proactive and to attempt to rein this thing and regulate it before it, it actually not only gets out of hand, but actually becomes a reality where, whereby we see these systems being deployed in, in different theaters of, or, or different uh, uh, scenarios. They have been described as the third revolution of warfare in the history of mankind. The first being <coughs> gunpowder, the second being nuclear weapons, and the third looming revolution in warfare is, is, is related to, to, uh, to fully autonomous weapon systems because, because they would drastically, <coughs> drastically alter what we understand to be the normal conduct of, of warfare. So there are risks, again, uh, uh, in terms of, of, uh, of, of the applicability and, and ability to comply with inter and the fundamental precepts of international humanitarian law, like precaution, disti distinction, proportionality, but also because it may give the impression to certain nations, to those that hold them, that, that the threshold for, for going into war is much lower, because you, it may give the impression that you're not risking life when, when, when making the decision to go, the, 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 the consequential decision of engaging in warfare, because you're, you're sending systems and not your compatriots, it may lower the actual threshold of going into war and, 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 and sort of in a vicious circle um, create further incentives for, for military uh, confrontation. Uh, because the stakes are so high, different groups, different sectors, where, again, within and without governments, have already come out and spoken against the, the very possibility of fully autonomous weapon systems. Uh, Project Plowshares, the organization I work for, uh, uh, has joined something called the campaign, the international campaign to stop killer robots. And, and the, the position of this campaign is that uh, allowing systems to make decisions of life or death cross a fundamentally moral line that we don't want to be crossed. And that is the fundamental position. And that is why the, 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 the basic call of the campaign to stop killer robots is a, preempt, a preemptive ban on fully autonomous weapon systems, full stop. No room for, for well, ifs and buts and maybe, you know, let's see how it, uh, play, how it plays out. It's really, we think, members of the coalition think that it's, that it's uh, we really don't want to go down that path, that the, the implications are dire and that the implications are unpredictable uh, to some extent and that it is in nobody's interest to, to unleash this, this beast, if you will, of, the, of, of, of fully autonomous uh, weapon systems. Uh, so it's a coalition of dozens of, of, of uh, organizations, I think it's 60 uh, something at the, at the latest count from, from all continents uh, that are really working uh, uh, um, diligently and steadfastly toward uh, 
a, 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 a preemptive ban on, on, on lethal autonomous weapon systems. And there are progressive states that are also supportive of this view. There are also uh, roboticists and artificial <laughs> intelligence professionals and ethicists and, and, and people in academia, scholars, etc., who have come out against uh, the, the development of uh, autonomous, uh, autonomous weapon systems. And there was an open letter, which some of you may have read from the, uh, from, from, it has thus far been signed by, by more than 20,000 professionals in the artificial intelligence field, uh, <coughs> uh, robotics, ethics, et cetera, uh, again, calling for a ban on fully autonomous weapon systems, even while realizing that they do not yet exist. But, uh, but again, the fundamental underlying premise is that we do not want to go down that line. Some signatories include, for example, Stephen Hawking, uh, Elon Musk, uh, uh, Steve Wozniak from, from Apple, Noam Chomsky uh, uh, from MIT. So, so, you know, lots of prominent individuals have come out and, 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 and uh, spoken out about, against the, the development of lethal autonomous weapons. Just gonna, uh, this is the actual letter. It's, you can find it online. It's called Autonomous Weapons, an open letter from artificial intelligence and robotics researchers. I'll, I'll quote just three brief lines. Um, first, they define what they are, that they can engage targets without human intervention. But the three lines that I'll quote, the first is, the key question for humanity today is whether to start a global artificial intelligence arms race or to prevent one from starting. That is the key question from their perspective. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that we can, uh, at Plouchers and at the campaign, associate uh, with. They go on to say that just as most chemists and biologists have no interest in building chemical or biological weapons, most artificial intelligence researchers have no interest in building artificial intelligence weapons and do not want others to tarnish their field by doing so, potentially creating a major backlash against artificial intelligence that curtails its future societal benefits. So they recognize that while there is some gains to be made from furthering the field of artificial intelligence, they don't want to taint that field with the development of weapons. And, and they, they, in a way, they refute uh, perhaps the intuitive notion that people, people might have of artificial intelligence researchers that this will be the ultimate playground, you know, of de developing or, or researching autonomous weapon systems when they, in fact, flat out reject that notion. They say, we don't want to be involved. And uh, the finally, and this is the way they close the, the letter, they say, starting a military artificial intelligence arms race is a bad idea and should be prevented by a ban on offensive autonomous weapons beyond meaning, meaningful human control. So they leave really no room for ambiguity and it's really uh, very authoritative uh, individuals who have come out and in support of a ban on, uh, on, on autonomous weapon systems. So again, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, not only showing proactivity, but also rec recognizing the, the dangerous uh, path that, w that humanity would be, would be in should, should these developments uh, um, start. Um, <coughs> A key question has to do with international humanitarian law. And, 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 when, and there are two related questions. Uh, two related questions, and there is no consensus on them. I mean, in Geneva, I mean, if uh, there was a, rec uh, uh, a salient feature was the, the diversity of views that you would hear from, 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 uh, from states that were present there. Uh, I think about 90 states were, were present there with delegations. The P5 was there, Canada was there. Uh, you know, the major players were there. Uh, the first question is, that, does international humanitarian law cover uh, uh, autonomous weapon systems, or would it cover, they don't exist, would it cover autonomous weapon systems? And the second related question is, even if it does cover uh, uh, autonomous weapon systems, are, uh, can autonomous weapon systems in fact comply with the, with the requirements of international humanitarian law. There, uh, there's a subtle but, 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 but important distinction there. So whether or not it covers autonomous weapon systems, again, there was a diversity of views, but the, by and large, people said it should cover them because uh, in, the, in the conduct of warfare, you know, any, 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 any weapon should be covered by international humanitarian law. 
Some exceptions that, or that, 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 that people pointed out to were, were, for example, that IHL specifically deals with the conduct of war. International humanitarian law are the laws of war. But there are conceivable uses not related to, to combat or to warfare, you know, for domestic policing for, for that are not covered under the international, international humanitarian law for, you know, a quickie mart security guard that <laughs> an autonomous weapon, that's an exaggeration. But that sort of thing that, that, that could have, you know, uh, could be a slippery slope, and, 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 but one can easily think of situations not caught, that are not technically the, under the rubric of armed conflict and theref thereby would not be covered by international humanitarian law. Uh, and, and, and the second question, which is a more controversial one, is could fully autonomous weapon systems actually comply with the, with the spirit, the objective, and the specific provisions of international humanitarian law. And this is where there's a host of views. I mean, the, the, the basic answer is today they cannot. You cannot guarantee infallibility. I mean, you cannot guarantee that they will be able to comply with principles, again, of distinction, precaution, proportionality, which are central tenets of international humanitarian law. Uh, there is something called Article 36 of the, of the which is a, a bit of a litmus test, Article 36 of the Additional Protocol to the Geneva Conventions, which relates to new weapon systems. And basically what uh, Article 36 obligates states who are considering the development of weapon systems to beforehand, proactively, uh, uh, consider whether or not such weapon systems would be in fact compatible with the with fundamental precepts, not only of international uh, humanitarian law, but all other applicable uh, applicable international law that, that might apply to to, to their use. And the, our position is that you cannot that the, the, the Article 36 threshold cannot be met by by autonomous weapon systems, and there is room for mistake and room for for precision. Uh, at the same time. And this is perhaps the, the most important point I want to make today, is that, uh, uh, that our rejection, our opposition to fully autonomous weapon systems should not only be based on the limitations of, 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 of its ability to, to, to comply with international humanitarian law. In other words, we hear scenarios of, you know, what if you send a system to Fallujah and with a certain algorithm and it makes a mistake, thereby, therefore it's not acceptable. My counter question is, what if it didn't make that mistake? Would it then be acceptable? What if it did, what if, because if we are, if, the, if, if our opposition is based on technical limitations, rest assured that they will be overcome. They will become more and more precise. But then we are still left with the question, do we still reject uh, the notion that, 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 that uh, fully autonomous weapon systems are making the life and death, the life and death decisions. Even, even they, they can't comply with IHL, but even if they were to comply fully with IHL, do we still reject them? And my answer is yes. And, and uh, uh, there is uh, Wendell, Wendell Wallach, who's an uh, artificial intelligence researcher, he, he refers to, to, to these, uh, these weapon systems being uh, what they call mala in se. They are, they are evil in themselves. You, you don't need to go further than or try to, to debate them only, only, although it's a valid argument, their applicability, their ability to comply with IHL, you cannot debate them only on their limitations, their te technical limitations, uh, because otherwise, sooner or later, they'll have the better arguments. So I'll say, you know, uh, statistically, human beings have a, a, a certain percentage rate of, of mistake, and we we are above and beyond that. So therefore, these should be acceptable, or these should be the way to go. And we have to be able to say no, as a matter of principle, as a matter of ethics, as a matter of mor morality. We, as humanity, are simply not comfortable with the notion of letting these sy these systems make life or death uh, uh, decisions. So the ethical argument, I think, is is crucial. And it's not a, a, a peacenik thing to say. It's just, a, it's a really, a, a, from a humanitarian perspective, there's just something, uh, I like the, the way, the way uh, Walter Ward it, you know, visceral about the rejection of, uh, 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 to, these, to these systems that, that again, are, are mala insane. Uh, what are some of the key challenges and difficulties that I noticed, uh, that I, uh, I noticed in Geneva? Um, let me backtrack a little bit. So this, uh, the, these issues dealt with the, CCW, which uh, I said is the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. In, 2000, in May of 2014, so <laughs> roughly two years ago, it held its first act informal experts meeting on fully autonomous weapons. 
at, this is a welcome development and, 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 and it's encouraging that there is some diplomatic attention despite the disagreements, despite the, the, the evident uh, uh, divisions and, 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 and multiplicity of views, it's, it's welcome. You know, there is a forum to discuss these, these, uh, these issues uh, head on. So what are, what are some of the key difficulties that people are, are, are grappling with? Uh, one has to do with definitional precision. And again, it's more the, than a matter of semantics. Uh, is, it, is it lethal autonomous weapon systems? So, so for example, if we take that acronym, and as I said, there are, there are others, but if we take lethal autonomous weapon systems, is it, would they be just as unacceptable if they cause you know, damage, but we're not technically sp speaking lethal? Is it the lethality that makes <coughs> a difference between, between you know, something that, that can you know, uh, maim you or, 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 or hurt you badly, but not kill you? Would they then be acceptable? Is, it does, is the lethality a, you know, a, a, a requisite sine qua non? You know, it has to be there. There or is it or is it is is the, its ability to engage humans period it, to cause harm or damage to human beings period you know sufficient grounds for, for rejection these are the sorts of questions autonomy how do you define autonomy I mean and, and it really I mean, if you heard the and these are available online the different statements from delegations you know what's the difference between between autonomy and automation you know it's a Google car. Uh, autonomous. I mean, all these. The, uh, is it, uh, what what can you do to, to address these these questions of, of definition? The question of meanif meaningful human control. What really? Where is the, the standard for meaningful human control? The 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 the, uh, the notwithstanding other proposals from other delegations that say, well, appropriate human control should be sufficient, but it's not entirely clear what the di distinction is between between uh, one or the uh, or the other. So these are the sort of matters of semantics that are that are that are that are still being debated, and for which I I won't have a definitive answer uh, for you. But but uh, uh, suffice it to say that that uh, the campaign considers then that despite some open questions, you know, and, and you, can, you, can, you can debate these things ad nauseum uh, uh, and in perpetuity. Uh, it's not beyond, at, at present you can in fact understand what we're talking about. We feel, you know, it's, 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 it's clear enough that w what, what it is that we don't want. We don't want machines making life or death decisions we, without human intervention. I think at its most basic the concept is, is sufficiently clear to, to, to start thinking about a preemptive ban of what we don't want. The dual use dimension, which, which uh, again Walter mentioned, is, is, is uh, very important and uh, is seen by some to be a stumbling, blo a stumbling block. I should say that it is, the dual use is not exclusive to, to lethal autonomous weapons or fully autonomous weapon systems. It cuts across a, a host of, of arms control related issues as, you know, to give a couple of obvious examples. Nuclear energy can be used for, for you know, for life-saving medical isotopes, but also for nuclear bombs that destroy Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, and that sort of thing. A, a drone, an unmanned aerial a vehicle can be used for search and rescue operations. Can you, you be used to survey Fort McMurray? And, and plan of an appropriate response, but it can also be used for extrajudicial assassination, uh, assassination somewhere in the backwood with, where there's no accountability and no oversight. So that's a problem. I mean, how do we how do we disaggregate the good from the bad, or is it a package deal that you have to take the good with the bad and then try to try to uh, um, regulate it after the fact? And this has been a source of resistance from many delegations that they, that they, that although there are some that are openly uh, proposing a ban on, on fully autonomous weapon systems, others are saying, yeah, we're not ready to support that because we don't want to miss out on the good, uh, on, the, on, the, on the benefits that artificial intelligence could be, can, bring, can, can bring to, to, to society, to, humans, uh, to human uh, civilization, so, so a ban might preclude that. Uh, the answer is, is no. I mean, you, you can still have the good. Where we're banning is the bad. I mean, it's very clear what we don't want. So you can still have your, your self-driving vehicles. You can still have your, your, your fridge that you know, knows how much ice you want, and your, uh, that sort of thing. But what we don't want is fully autonomous weapon systems. So, so, so we feel that, that it is a bit of an of a, of a, um, argument that's not quite as persuasive that, 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 that uh, that uh, by banning what we don't want, we are necessarily uh, uh, preventing the benefits of artificial intelligence or other developments from, from reaching society. 
Another complication is how diffuse this development is. Unlike, for example, nuclear weapons, which are, you know, it's a very limited number of actors or entities that have control over nuclear technology. You know, you can isolate them. You can count them on your, on your hands almost, you know, whoever who has this number of countries and these number of, you, you know, silos and, 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 and facilities for them. And you can isolate them in a way, even if there are challenges. With, the, with autonomous weapons, you know, there's a host of, of actors in industry, academia, etc., that are that are working actively to advance artificial intelligence, and they may not be. Uh, I'm not implying ill intention there. They may. They just because of human ingenuity, curiosity. These uh, these these capabilities are being developed. It's a matter of are they going to be adapted for military purposes, and and um, and how do you how do you if if there is an attempt to regulate them, how do you really cover? All the all the actors that have an interest uh, in 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 these uh, in these uh, technology. So, in terms of, of the so these are again uh, the sorts of issues that you would hear at, at, at the United United Nations recently about. The, uh, I think some countries are trying to to wrap their heads around really what we're talking about, but at the same time, uh, the campaign to stop killer robots and Project Cloudshare and some progressive countries say, "Hey, we know enough." about what we don't want that we can really start thinking about a, a moratorium or a, or a, a preemptive uh, ban. Uh, Canada, uh, again, uh, and Walter already alluded to this, is, is, is uh, sitting on the fence on this. And um, <coughs> part of the argument is the dual use argument. They, they, they say that, that you know, they won't get on board a ban because they might, they might be precluding some benefits autonomous, of autonomous weapon systems. I'll, I'll read from the statement they gave in Geneva recently. Uh, Canada said, while Canada remains concerned about the implications of increasing levels of, of autonomy in weapon systems, Canada does not believe that banning technology, especially dual-use technology, is likely to be the best approach at this point in addressing the operational, moral, ethically, ethical, or policy risks that laws may pose. Rather, we believe that the most practical and meaningful way forward is to focus on examining the implications of using different types of autonomous weapons in different contexts. In other words, we're not ready yet. More discussion is, 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 is uh, required. Uh, last week, in the context of the defense policy review that the Department of National Defense is, is conducting right now, I know uh, that uh, they, they were holding a, a panel discussions specifically on, on, on the future of, war of warfare. And, and, uh, and that covered outer space security, cyber, cyber matters, and, and um, and lethal autonomous weapon systems. So they're, at, I think, I, I say this as a posi positive development that at least they're inviting experts and, and, and seem to be wanting to, to gain a better um, understanding of the implications of, of, of these systems. But uh, for the time being, uh, Canada would be on, on the camp that is not on board with a, with a ban on fully autonomous weapon systems. So to conclude, I, I just reiterate that the position of Project Plowshares and that of the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots is to support a preemptive ban on autonomous weapon systems. We, we think that the risks are already clear. There, there can be further discussion on the intricacies uh, and the technical details, et cetera, but we already know it's already sufficiently clear what it is that we don't want, and it's a, it's a, it's a dangerous path for the international community to be in if these systems are in fact deployed and used. So thank you. Thank you.